Now, Pastor Kevin, who you just met a moment ago, um, was one of the inspirations for the message series that we find ourselves in called Epic. We've been on this one-year Bible journey, and we just completed the Old Testament last week. And today we're diving into the New Testament for the first time. So all that we've been studying to date here as a church, the prophets of old from Genesis to Malachi, all pointed to this coming Savior, a day and age where Jesus would come to redeem all of mankind. And we're getting to meet him for the first time. Now, when we subtitled this message, actually, uh, uh, he's the one who, Kevin actually is the one who told us to do it. He subtitled in the following way, this is God's love story for all of mankind throughout history. And wow, he is absolutely correct, and we're getting to see a bit of that in the life of Matthew. Is that me doing that or somebody else? It's just me. What do I got to do different? Come on, Jesus, help me out here. All right. We'll tighten this up. Here we go. We'll try again. Why don't we pray? Because it sounds dangerous. Father, we thank you. And today, as we dive into the book of Matthew, we ask you, O oh God, to touch our hearts and touch our minds. For those of us who have been here throughout the course of the whole year, man, we've experienced a lot of things that pointed to this very moment. And today, I ask you to move by the power of the Holy Spirit to touch hearts, to change minds, to draw people into repentance, to call them from darkness into light. And Lord, we can't thank you enough for being at work in our lives. And Father, we ask you to just move among us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So if you missed last week's message, I want to encourage you to go watch it uh, online. Go ahead and download the Journey Church app where you can follow along with today's message as well. Or you can find anything that you might have missed already. So I apologize for those of you who are trying to read with our epic scriptures because we put on the screen last week that we'd be reading from Matthew chapter 1, but I really feel led to read from Matthew chapter 9, which is where we're going to go today. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 9 or find it on your phone or watch it on the screens. A few simple words end up changing Matthew's life in a huge way. Now Matthew is a hot mess when we encounter him in the midst of this story. At the beginning of the story, he is not Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew, who we think of as Matthew the evangelist, a guy who probably had it all together. He's there writing the words that we're actually reading today. He was in an entirely different mindset. He was far from God, but a couple words are about to change his life. So we find ourselves in today's story in the city of Capernaum. And Mary Jo, have had a bless Mary jo and I have had the blessing and honor of visiting this city three times in our life. And every time it was epically amazing to go check it out and see this place where Jesus really set up as his home base in the sea, right adjacent to the Sea of Galilee. Now, when I read scriptures in my modern-day mindset, I'm from Miami. I think huge city. I think, you know, just block after block, street after street, just a huge place. But the city of Capernaum in Jesus' day was actually a very small place. It wasn't very large at all. In fact, the uh, temple is at one end, and the water is at the other end, and it's all of about three blocks from one end to the other going widthwise, then probably only maybe five to ten blocks going deep in the other direction. So the town was bustling, though, in those days, but it was a small place. Everybody, no doubt, knew everybody's business. They knew who was sinning. They knew who was cutting up. They saw the things that Jesus was doing. They encountered his friends. In fact, Peter, man, he had waterfront property. He was like two blocks from where the temple was, and in one block in the other direction, he was right there on the Sea of Galilee. And it is in this context where Jesus was at. All of this was a very, very small town, and on this very faded day, something crazy ends up happening. Before we read the scripture, um, it's also under Roman domination at that time. So think about um, Italians. I don't know about you, but I have one kind of thing that I, uh, I like to watch at times, sadly, which is some of the old mafia movies. Anybody like that at all that cares to admit it? But like, so there's some, like... Uh, uh, Goodfellas was an old one from 1990, 
and uh, the good old bad movie that you probably shouldn't watch, but um, 1990s era movie. And in that movie, Ray Liotta is one of the stars of the movie, and he's a Jewish guy that could never kind of make it inside of the mafia to be a made man because he's Jewish. He was an Italian, right? So when you think of Matthew, uh, maybe these later stories of modern-day mafiosos are actually a little bit like what it was all about back then because the Romans are actually Italian, so he's kind of operating, sadly, for the mafia just a little bit here. Matthew 9.9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and he followed him. Man, there's a lot going on in that short verse. While Matthew's name means a gift from God, at that point in his life, he's not operating as one. Think of him as your friendly neighborhood IRS agent. How many of you love IRS? If you're one in the room, I feel sorry for you. We don't love our IRS agents, but more so, he's like the Ray Liotta of the day. He's the guy that's working for the Italian mafia going to collect the money from the Jewish people, from his own people. He's willing to persecute them. He's taking money and he's skimming it and he's putting it in his own back pocket. I mean, he is not a good guy. And to the Jewish mind, to sell out another Jew in that way was the unredeemable offense. You could not be redeemed. You could not be saved. There is no hope for you if you were living that way. So the people around him look at him as the scum of the earth, and probably rightly so. So this is the Matthew that you're reading in the Word. This is what his old life was really like. We can never forget that. I know I read Scripture sometimes, Matthew, Luke, John, and we think of all the good things that they did. But the reality was he was a depraved guy. And two words changed his life. Follow me. Follow me. Now, maybe, just maybe, remember I mentioned it was a small town. Um, If you go tell the mobster on day one, follow me, maybe they're not going to follow you, right? Maybe he had witnessed some things. Maybe he had seen and heard some things going on. Remember, the temple's just two blocks from there. Maybe he had heard Jesus' voice preaching in the temple. Maybe he had witnessed the scene just a few days before the one that we're reading where there was a paralytic person who was healed and stood up and began praising God. Maybe he saw that. He no doubt heard the buzz about Jesus all around town. He was there. You couldn't get away from it. Remember, it was a small town. As we read this story about Matthew, I do want you to interject yourself in his place. See, yes, it's a story about him to a degree. More so, it's a story about Jesus. But it's a story about all of us. All of our need for a Savior. All of us need to know this coming King who we've been reading about for months on end, who we're finally about to encounter. What was important to him? Who did he come to save? Why is he here on earth? Why is he in Capernaum at that day? Now, the party in one verse goes from, it goes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, to Matthew 9, 10. And in one quick verse, it shifts from follow me to come to my house for a party. Now, remember who this guy is, right? So think about all, you know, like, think about like the craziest rap video that you've ever seen with everybody out there. I mean, DJ Khaled's out there spinning records out there for them that day, and they're out there partying, and it was Ray, Le- not Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta did have a coke problem in that movie, too. But what was the other one with uh, the guy who had like the big bowl of cocaine, and it was really, none of you seen these movies? I guess I am sick. What is it? Scarface, yeah, that famous scene where the dude has that. So this is Matthew's house, right? Y'all are not sinners here. This message is not going over good. Y'all got issues, man. I mean, I've got issues, I should say. So normally, Friday nights at Matthew's house is the place to be, if you get that picture, right? All the sinners, everybody who's the friends of this guy are coming over to his house, and all of a sudden, there's this huge bait and switch, Matthew 9, 10. And Jesus reclines at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. 
So imagine if you're one of the tax collectors or sinners and you show up on that and I'd be like, buzzkill, what just happened? I mean, we showed up here. Normally there's, you know, a DJ spinning records and all of a sudden this guy Jesus is here at the table. What in the world has happened to Matthew? Jesus at a table with society's lowest, the unredeemables. He's hanging out with the rejects. He's hanging out with the drug addicts. He's hanging out with the prostitutes. He's hanging out with the shady business people. He's, shady, he's hanging out with the shady used car salesmen. No offense if any of you are used car salesmen in the room. Even the bankers, the politicians. How about this one? He's hanging out with the gays, the lesbians, the LGBT people. Do you think of him as doing that? He is. That's what scripture says. He's there hanging out with the people that good Christians shouldn't be hanging out with. Do you get that? That's really good news for you and I. That's amazing news. No matter how far you've strayed from God, maybe your sins don't seem as bad or as unredeemable as the ones that I've been describing. It means that he loves you and he was willing to come and die for you. How amazing is that revelation? Many of you have already experienced that in your life. You've experienced the overwhelming, everlasting love of God, and it's changed your life. I'd ask you to remember back to those days. Remember what that was like. May God restore the joy of your salvation if you've lost it somewhere along the way. If you wouldn't call yourself a believer and all the Christians that you've ever met were pointing fingers at you rather than embracing you and you find yourself here today, thank God you are here you came to the right place. We're not here to judge you. We're here to tell you about this Savior who loves you enough to die that you might have life. So think about your life. What was it like before you became a believer in Jesus Christ? Maybe verse 10 is your old life, your old friends. See, normally Matthew wouldn't have wanted Jesus at that party because it would have been a buzzkill. But now, infused by the power of the Holy Spirit, Matthew wants his friends to be redeemed. He wants them to know Jesus. He's no longer embarrassed. He wants them to know this person who saved him and changed him. I think it's so cool that Matthew, this author, he's there and he's writing this beautiful book that we're all reading. And then he slyly interjects himself into the middle of the story in chapter 9. How cool is that? He's sharing his testimony in the midst of what we're reading. When I read scripture, like I said, my tendency is to think all of these super saints were perfect all their lives, but they were not. They were just like you and me. They had issues. They had challenges. They had fears. They were living lifestyles that were far from God, and then God touches them. And then Matthew, the sinner, Matthew, the tax collector, begins to become Matthew, the evangelist, who we read even 2,000 years later. How amazing is that? He wants to introduce them to the sweet fragrance of the irresistible love and grace of God. Would all his friends get saved? No, probably not, right? But he sure would do everything within his power for the rest of his life from that moment forward to try to share the love of God with them with the hope that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now we're introduced to another group of people in the next set of verses. See, there was Jesus, there was the tax collectors, there was the sinners, and then there were the Pharisees, right? Sadly, I think, the longer we become Christians, the more pharisaical our mindset could be if we're not careful to put it in place and to begin to check it, right? All of a sudden, we're pointing fingers at other people about their sins. That person's a drug dealer. That person's gay. That person's this. Whatever our pet peeve sins are, we go point at it. And what you learn in recovery circles is that when you have one finger pointing in this direction, you have three pointing in the other one right back at you, right? May you grasp that for a second. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They looked at these people and they forgot where they came from. They forgot that they too were one point unregenerate sinners who were in need of a savior. And then they got saved, and then all of a sudden, they're too holy for everybody else, right? Oh my goodness, how crazy is that? But don't we have that same tendency within each of us? See, what also tends to happen is the longer you're a Christian, the less unsaved people you hang out with. 
we got to be intentional about it. we got to remember to go out there to those who are different than us, people who are far from us. They're not part of our normal circle of friends anymore, but they're in need of a Savior, are they not? Now, we need to use wisdom in this. Someone shared with me at the conclusion of the first service that initially they thought they were going out there to help their friends who were still in certain lifestyles that they did not want to be a part of, and it's a lot easier at times for people to drag you down than it is for you to lift them up, if that makes sense, right? So you need to use wisdom in this. If you are an alcoholic, don't go straight back to the bar trying to evangelize people by yourself. You need another person along with you so that you can be strong when you go into that kind of situation. So we do need to use wisdom in this, but think right now, how many friends do you have in your life that are far from God? If there's not a lot of them, maybe that needs to change. I see a couple heads shaking. Everybody else is like, this guy's crazy. I mean, like, but this is what it's saying in the scriptures that we're reading today. See, we get disconnected from people. We get disconnected from the world that they live in. We get disconnected from their pains, their challenges, their heartbreaks. We no longer invite them over. We only spend time with other people who know Jesus, and sometimes y'all are boring. (laughs) Right? Lord, set us free. But even more so, we forget about the depths of our own depravity. We don't like to think about that, do we? We don't like to think about how we used to be and how we used to act and the things that we used to do or that some of us still do. We like to push that down. We're not that bad. That prostitute, she's worse than I am. Well, if you're acting pharisaical, guess what? The Bible says you're worse than she is and your chances of getting saved are less than hers. Grasp that one for a moment, right? So this is a natural tendency that the devil tries to build upon in our lives to keep us distracted, to keep us from the things that really matter, to help us think and puff up ourselves rather than remembering who we are. We can never forget the depths of our own depravity. That's why every time we do communion, I want to encourage you, come up and remember what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Surrender those sins over to Jesus. May he renew our passion for the lost. May we be intentional in reaching out to people who are far from him. Matthew 9, 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. Desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. How amazing is that? What an opportunity that presents us with to go after people who were a lot different like us or who maybe are a lot like us, but we've overcome that which they're still struggling in. What an opportunity for us as believers to be Jesus' hands and feet. That religious spirit the devil wants to implant in our hearts is what he's trying to do. He wants to make you religious. He wants to forget, make you forget about your relationship with Jesus. We need to be deliberate about deliberately introducing our friends and loved ones to the love and grace of God. He came to heal the sick. He came for the sinners. He came to offer mercy. Might we first realize that we're all in the same boat first, though, right? Might we remember who we used to be As you read on in chapter 9, there's a question about fasting. Then there's a few more incredible, miraculous stories about God healing people and setting them free. And then you encounter what is probably going to be the highlight of the chapter where somebody comes to Jesus and says that their daughter has passed away and that they want him to come pray over them. And Jesus is about to raise a young girl from the dead. How crazy is that? We could stop right there with the story, right? Wouldn't that seem to be, in your mind, the most important thing that could be happening? If your child was dead, would you not go do everything you can to get them before Jesus, right? That would seem to be the most important thing in the world, but then all of a sudden, in the midst of that chapter, in the midst of Jesus, going from hearing this to going to heal, deliver, set free, and bring back from the dead this young girl, there's a pause in the middle of the conversation. 
And I read it, and I'm like, why in the world did, you know, did Matthew just stop in the middle of this? Why would Jesus just stop in the middle of this? There could be nothing more important at that moment than rising this young girl from the dead. But Jesus, knowing who he is, I guess, he's not worried about it. He's got this in the natural. We would all be freaking out, right? But there's this story that pops up right in the middle of that. And it baffled me, but it also told me a lot about who Jesus really is. An interruption, a pause, Matthew 9, 20. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Pause and think about that for a moment. I bet some of you have some deep things going on right now in your life. Some challenges maybe that you've not been able to overcome. I'd ask you, what is your attitude in the midst of the struggle? This lady had suffered for 12 years with that issue. Some of you have been suffering that long or longer with different things in spirit, soul, or body. Challenges in your relationships, challenges in your physical health, challenges in a variety of different areas. Have you given up? Don't give up. <laughs> Keep pressing in. Remember this woman. Remember that even in the midst of what other crises might be abounding, maybe some of you are thinking, my deal ain't that big. Other people are suffering with things that are a lot bigger than I. Is Jesus still stopped because he cared, and he cares for you. No matter how big or small your issue is, Jesus loves you and is for you and is not against you, but we have to go after the hem of his garment. we got to keep pressing in. We can't give up whatever that thing is that you're struggling with. Don't give up. Keep pressing in. And guess what? One day the miracle will happen. And then when it does happen, guess what? Your first tendency is going to be to think like, that ain't real. And it might, it might take a little bit of time to sink in. I know many things in my life are that way. I prayed for something for 10 years, and all of a sudden it happened. And then like two months later, I'm still like, is it going to stay? I mean, like, what's going on? But God really heals. God really delivers. God really sets free. And some of you walked in here with great pain in this place today, and he wants you to lay it down. He wants you to lay it at the altar. He wants to free you from that. Would we reach out continually for the hem of his garment? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Father, I believe with all my heart that you have the ability to make the blind see, to raise the dead to life, to make the mute speak, to have the deaf hear. Lord, we read about those kinds of things, to have the paralytic be able to get up and walk. But perhaps the greatest miracle we read in all those was the miracle of what you did in Matthew's life. A guy working for the mafia, so to speak. Someone we would think of as totally unredeemable. You changed his heart in an instant, and you've done the same thing for many of us who are here today. You changed our hearts. We heard that call, follow me, and we responded. Man, I am so grateful I responded to that call. I remember that day I walked up to that church building, and I was like, if anybody says anything, I'm going to knock them out. I came in so hardened, and then I heard the message, and then by the end of the sermon, I was like, can we come back next week? And my wife was like, what possessed you? You know, we're supposed to go to the beach. No, I want to go back to church. That day, mine, like Matthew, changed forever. May 31st of 1992 changed my life forever. Maybe today, this day, will be the day where your life changes forever. If you walk through these doors and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, just know that God called you here on purpose to hear this message and I would encourage you to surrender your life to him. Maybe you've been a believer for some time, but you're like the woman with the issue of blood and there's challenges and difficulties and 
Maybe you've felt like giving up and you've exhausted all options and you've gone to every doctor and you've done everything that you could think of in the natural. Today, I would encourage you to just lay down at Jesus' feet one more time and say, Jesus, help me. Regardless of what that issue is, if it's spiritual and you need to rededicate your life to Christ, do that right here, right now. It's a safe place. Leave here changed. If it's a soul issue with relationships or with finances or with things in the natural that are causing you difficulties and challenges that you need to lay down or get help for or wisdom about, he will dispense it liberally in this place. Maybe something's going on in your physical body and you need a healing. I want to pray for you and ask God to intervene in your life. He's the one who created you. He can certainly heal you. If he delivered that young girl from the dead, he could certainly deal with whatever's going on in your life. And if your issue is one of sin, it's time to lay it down. It's time to lay it down and walk out of here in newness of life. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I would like to pray for you. If any of those things resonated with you, if you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, or if you need a touch from God to bring healing into your life, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor? Everybody's heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Raise your hand up real high so I can see it. I see your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. God is moving. Thank you, Lord, and yours and yours and yours. Thank you, Lord. Again, I don't want to embarrass you. I promise you I won't, but I would like to pray with you. I want to encourage you to be like the woman with the issue of blood and run through the crowds for just a moment and come up here. I'd like to shake your hand if that's you. Would you do that? Everybody around you, would you clap for these folks? God bless you. God bless you. Stay right here. God bless you. You can stay over here. God bless you, man. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Come on this way just a little bit. Let the others through. God bless you and you. Come on, Journey. You're clapping like Pharisees. You need to clap like believers. Welcome. God bless you. And you. God bless you. And you. God bless you. And you. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Y'all can spread out a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> Well, Father, we do come before you. We bow our heads just one more time, and we do come before you in celebration with the many who have come up today just conceding and surrendering their hearts and minds to you, whether for the first time or anew. Lord, we join with them in saying, Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. And together as a faith family, we just commit or recommit our lives to you at this very moment saying, Jesus, have your will and your way in our hearts and minds. Would you forgive us of our sins as we lay them at your feet? Would you empower us as you did Matthew to have the power over our old ways so that we could walk forth from this place in newness of life to live for you and serve you all the days of our life? Father, for those who might have sickness and spirit, soul, or body, we pray for them right now that even as you touch the woman with the issue of blood, we mix our faith. And you said to her, your faith has made you whole. These people were faithful enough to ignore what the crowd said and say, I'm coming up here to the front to get my healing. And I ask you to meet them in this place today, Lord, that you would touch them, that you would heal them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would guide them, direct them, and make them whole in spirit, soul, and body. Lord, we thank you for this precious moment. We thank you that the people of Journey Church have a heart to invite others, that these altars are full, that this is a place where sinners are welcome, Lord God, a place where you can continue to move. Would you remove from our heart any pharisaical tendencies? Lord, any tendencies that we might have to point our finger at others, Lord, would you remind us that in turn we're bringing judgment upon ourselves? Would you free us from that and free us to go out and make a difference for you? For those who came to the front, we would love to give you some next steps and some more information to help you start your way of Christ off with a great walk or simply get a prayer request down if there's more prayers that you need for healing in yourself or your family. I would encourage you to not immediately go back to your seats, but see one of those counselors who's around you. They'd like to give you more information. God bless you. Would you give them all one more big, huge round of applause?
Before we go, I have one more set of scriptures for you. It's found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 37. It says, And Jesus went throughout the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You see, we as Christians, we are those laborers. The harvest out there is plentiful. If we'll live out God's word in our everyday life, if we'll be about reaching out to other people and sharing the good news of the gospel, what might God do to transform our city? So as we get ready to leave, I want to challenge you in that. Come join us this Thursday night. Pray and intercede with us, asking God to move in the midst of Journey Church and in our very hurting city. And then would you ask God to use you and then go out there and be faithful in sharing the good news of the gospel. Have a wonderful week, everybody. God bless you.